Stanford University. So I'm uh, Michael Heinrich. I'll be your host essentially for these nine weeks as we delve into the topic of consciousness. And I'm um, particularly delighted to see such an interesting and varied audience. We've got ambitious Stanford students, Stanford professors. We even got some really interesting community members. Uh, we've got some Google engineers amongst us. We've got uh, senior VPs and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies as well as startups. We've got meditators and non-meditators. So a really interesting um, group of people. But before we get started, I'd also like to sort of thank a few people that have made this possible. Uh, first, our course advisors, uh, one of which is uh, Dr. Cesar Molina. He couldn't be with us today because he unfortunately had uh, travel booked before this course even was announced to him. But uh, he did his residency at Stanford. He practices at the El Camino Hospital. And he's also the co-founder of the South Asian Heart Center, which really um, is all about prevention through lifestyle change and sort of rest, diet, et cetera, is really part of that regime. Um, another course advisor is John Bright, who is with us here today. Um, thank you, John, for all your support. And uh, he is one of the leaders of the International Transcendental Meditation Movement, uh, TM for short. And uh, of course, Andrew Todd Hunter, who because of travel schedules is also not with us today, but he essentially is our course sponsor. He's in a, he's lectures in the Department of Biology and Creative Writing. And he's a really prolific writer, filmmaker, very, very creative and really made this possible. And of course, the Department of Biology and the head of biology, Bob, for sort of making this possible and sponsoring it. Um, so let me cover also, um, actually, let me also thank the Stanford TM group for sort of their support, helping market this. And you guys are awesome. Thanks for always showing up for group meditations. So uh, thank you for, for your support as well. So before we get started, let me also cover a few logistical things. If you've signed up for the one unit course, uh, you're allowed to miss one session since we only have nine sessions together. You know, ideally, I'd like to see you as much as possible. I understand if sometimes you have some conflict. But um, if you wouldn't mind and essentially put down your name and also your student ID to make sure that I have a record of you being here, then I can sort of make sure that you've actually attended the class. And before we start, too, do you have any questions about logistics, how the course will run? Any questions at all? Good, everybody. Oh, some question back there. Is there anything else required besides attending uh, the sessions? Um, ideally, you do also the, uh, the reading, the required reading. So on every speaker, we'll have their biography and usually some type of piece that they've either written or some piece written about them. And at the end, we also ask you to do a reflection piece, just a one-page um, paper, essentially, about what you've learned in the class or some piece of the reading, something like that. So and we really want to make it fun. So you can choose the medium. It could be a website if you wanted to. It could be just a paper. It's up to you, really. Other questions? We've already, we've already maxed credits in the audit this course. Yes, you may audit this course. And as I said, it's also open to the community because we invite sort of a really high quality audience so that we can really uh, push our speakers on this topic of consciousness and to really see you know, how scientifically validated it is. You know, so, so it'll be a lot of fun. So thanks for coming. Yes? Is there a syllabus? Yes, there's a syllabus. Um, were you on the initial email? No. OK. Um, are you registered for the course? or? OK, so um, have you signed up for the Google form that I sent out? No. All right, just leave your email with me. <laughs> <laughs> I will send you a syllabus. <laughs> All right, let me pass this through. Just pass it through. Yeah. And if you're a student, please sign in on this paper. And if you want, you can also leave me your email address in case you have not signed up for the Google form. Any other questions? Good, so let's dive into consciousness. So hacking consciousness, how did this come about? So I've always been fascinated by the topic of consciousness. As an undergraduate, I studied cognitive science. And the predominant worldview there is that this physical thing, the brain, this part of this that's matter, gives rise to mental processes. And these mental processes are then considered consciousness. But I always found that answer somewhat unsatisfactory. Because I asked myself, well, doesn't a flower have consciousness? Doesn't a tree have consciousness? I mean, there's some organizing power, right, to a flower or to a tree. 
what is that intelligence that makes a flower bloom? And then I also um, have always been really fascinated by meditation techniques. I've tried Qigong, I've tried mindfulness, Buddhist walking meditation, uh, contemplation meditation, um, Zen meditation. And I always wanted to dive into this idea of consciousness. And what I noticed is that when I think a thought, I can actually be conscious of me thinking a thought. So who is actually that observer behind that thought? And that's where sort of this whole interest came about in terms of hacking consciousness. And after undergraduate, I worked for a while and sort of forget, forgot about this topic until I found myself working for a man named Ray Dalio. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he runs a company called Bridgewater Associates. It's one of the most successful macro hedge funds of all time. And he said that he's been practicing this meditation technique called transcendental meditation for 40 years. And he said that that is one of his keys to success. And I said, that's a big endorsement, so why don't I try it out myself? And through there, again, got exposed to this topic of consciousness and really found myself, again, um, experiencing as well as getting intellectual knowledge about it. So I thought, now that I'm at Stanford doing graduate studies, why don't I um, have other people participate in this journey and really see what consciousness is all about? Um, can you access it? Can you hack it? How do you hack it? And those are some of the questions that our speakers will address over these nine weeks. Which brings me to Dr. John Higlin, who is our um, esteemed guest today. I could probably spend five minutes introducing his background, but I you won't know. do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just mention some highlights. He is uh, one of the most cited quantum physics physicists of our time. He has written over 100 research publications about SOAR. He has done groundbreaking research at both CERN and SLAC, our very own SLAC. He's um, been part of many movies, including movies like What the Bleep Do We Know, has had many TV appearances, and this list goes on and on. So I'd rather just have you hear from John Higlin himself. So please give a warm applause to Dr. John Higlin. I'm not mic'd. Can you hear me OK back there? Yeah. It's great to be back here, sunny. Campus looks wonderful. <laughs> and what a great audience. I haven't even talked to you yet, but just the description <laughs> of who you are should make this a lot of fun, certainly for me anyway. We're going to be introducing the subject of meditation basically from a very classic perspective, from the yogic tradition and from there, ultimately, the Buddhist tradition. And in the context of that, talking partly from the standpoint of a fundamental physicist, uh, what consciousness is, or at least what we think it might be, and ultimately experiential access to it. Consciousness, I'd have to say, is really self-hacking, but how do you <laughs> hack it? So in the process, I, I'm also an astrophysicist, or a half-astrophysicist. I like to always spend a moment locating ourselves in the structure of the universe, and here, of course, are the, I almost said nine, eight planets I grew up with nine. It's a sad story. And here they are in proper relative size to each other. They are certainly spaced farther apart than they look like in this. And our solar system is a pretty marvelous example of a solar system. We tend to be quite fond of it. It is our own, and we do live here. That's what Saturn looks like, like Jupiter, a gas colossus, a hydrogen and helium star, about a half a billion miles from the sun, about that distance from us as well. And it doesn't take much of a telescope to, in your backyard to see that incredible jewel out there like that. This is the ice world of Neptune, now the last, the eighth of eight planets. That's what the noonday sun looks like from Neptune. It's a little like Iowa in the winter. You <laughs> don't get much of a suntan there. And that's our solar system. Of course, we're living in a galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, with about 400 billion suns. Uh, most of those, we think, with some kind of a planetary system, not all. And in this sort of island universe, in this rather flat or pancake shape, and within our Milky Way galaxy, which uh, is that stripe, you can probably see the sky is good enough here that on a clear night you can see it, incredible things happen, like stellar explosions called supernova, which are responsible for the final last gasp in the life of a star that can result in this kind of cataclysmic explosion during which the heaviest elements get cooked, like gold and platinum, anything heavier than iron, thrown out into space, contaminate space, 
with heavier elements, because it really started as hydrogen and helium after the Big Bang. And from those heavier elements blown out into space, new stars form and planets form. Not just gas planets like Jupiter, but the Earth made of dirt, silica, iron, etc., all come as remnants of supernova explosions, our bodies comprised of things like you know, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, uh, were not cooked during the Big Bang. They were cooked in stars and then blown out into space from where our planets and our bodies were ultimately taken. If you take your backyard telescope and take it away from the plane of the Milky Way, out in the direction of deep space, and if you have a good telescope, you see this. You see more galaxies than stars. And each of these galaxies, remember, has several hundred billion suns. And you kind of get in a state of awe, a kind of a state of wonder. What enormous intelligence is this? What incredible creativity? What are the laws that govern it? And that's one of the quests of science and astronomy, all science, actually, to understand the fundamental laws governing the universe. So that's it for outer space. Uh, we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at inner space, the structure of reality at deeper and deeper levels. That means, in the language of physics at least, smaller and smaller space-time scales. And one of the things we've learned, one of the most important things we've learned from the last 100 years or more of physics is that the universe is structured in layers, structured in layers of creation, from superficial to fundamental from macroscopic to microscopic. And that inward exploration started at a very surface level, 300 years of classical mechanics dedicated to the study of macroscopic matter, but turned about 90 years ago towards the exploration of the deeper world of the atom, atoms and molecules, the world of quantum mechanics. And what we discovered is a little surprising, and probably not what you learned in high school, maybe what some of you have learned in college. And that is that the atom is not a billiard ball, and not a solar system in miniature. In high school, they maybe say that, well, you know, the sun is like the nucleus, and the planets are like the electrons orbiting the nucleus. It's a quaint picture, but it has absolutely nothing to do with reality. It serves no purpose, and it doesn't work at all. So quantum mechanics is a whole new language, a whole new logic, a whole new mathematics that is subtler, more expansive, more profound, and appropriate to describe physics at this more fundamental level. Very soon, physics went on to discover the atomic nucleus, to explore the nucleus, and the fundamental particles that comprise the nucleus, quarks and leptons, and a whole new language was needed for that. Not a radical departure, but a substantive departure called quantum field theory, which is the marriage of Einstein's relativity with quantum mechanics. Again, though, a whole new formalism, a whole new mathematics required. And then ultimately, the, certainly the, the hot topic in physics today, as it has been since the superstring revolution swept through here about 20 years ago, is maybe 25 years ago, starting with supergravity theory, is unified field theory which in today's you know, common, more common parlance is, is typically in the form of superstring theory and M theory. These theories are very exciting for reasons I really wish we could get into in great depth. I'll mention a few things. These theories fulfill Einstein's lifelong quest to discover the unified source of the diversified universe, the unified fountainhead of all the laws of nature that govern the functioning of the universe at every level. The mathematics of this is, is extremely daunting. Even though the fundamental reality is one of absolute simplicity, the mechanics of the expression of that fundamental unity into the diversity of the laws of nature is a rather complex, very nonlinear process involving self-interaction in a very non-trivial way. But if speaking qualitatively instead of heavily mathematically, the fundamental nature of this field of unity at the basis of all diversity is absolute silence. Absolute abstraction, almost. You could say pure existence, pure being. But it's not a field of inertia. It's not a field of, of death, 
I would say, because the quantum principle guarantees that intrinsically this field is dynamic. In fact, the quantum principle, or uncertainty principle as it's known, is the principle of increasing dynamism at fundamental scales. The same reason nuclear power is more powerful than chemical energy, even though in some respects it's very similar, but it operates at a level that is a million times smaller, and therefore operates at a level of nature's dynamism that is a million times more powerful. Due to this intrinsic dynamism of this universal field, the field is actually, well, you could say silent at its core, but it's roiling and boiling on the surface of life, erupting in this effervescence of of what looked like effervescent bubbles emerging from ginger ale. That's sometimes called zero point motion. These days it's called, or vacuum energy. These days it's called dark energy because it's this type of activity that is driving the universe today in this ever accelerating expansion that has been relatively recently discovered. Now for the astute audience, and most of you are certainly in that category, you probably have surmised that these bubbles aren't ginger ale, actually. But they are, these little rubber bands, these little loops, they are infinitesimal loops called superstrings. Little rubber bands, literally relativistic rubber bands, infinitesimal. And I know it's kind of depressing for those who are seeking the ultimate nature of reality to conclude that after all these years of profound philosophy and scientific research, we've discovered that the core reality of the universe is a rubber band. But it's not really what we're saying. It's not the rubber band that is fundamental. It's this universal field of intelligence, this intrinsically dynamic, self-interacting field that percolates superstrings. And these superstrings are what we used to think of as particles, the fundamental particles and forces of nature in the context of these theories are just the different vibrational states of these rubber bands. Now there's a certain type, you, you can sit down and you can examine the physics of a rubber band. You can count the different vibrational states, the different modes of vibration that a string, a rubber band can vibrate in, and you will conclude that each of those vibrational modes of a rubber band has its own frequency its own natural tone. That type of mathematical physicist that undertakes this calculation of the enumeration of the vibrational frequencies of rubber bands are called nerds. But they're very, very. <laughs> <laughs> but the miracle of superstring theory, just honestly simplify things quite a bit for the sake of time, is that these different vibrational tones these different vibrational frequencies of these fundamental superstrings, each frequency corresponding to a different energy. Because Einstein equates, uh, well, frequency, of course, and energy. And also, Einstein equates energy with mass. These different rubber bands, due to their different vibrational modes, have different amount of energy, which means different amount of mass. And when you look at those masses, and the other properties of these vibrating strings, lo and behold, you discover that this is a universe of just certain types of particles. One of those vibrational tones acts like gravity, a particle of gravity, a graviton. Another one acts like a particle of light, the spin one massless photon. Another one looks like a spin one half quark or an electron and so forth. And you get just the categories of matter and energy that we know and love, that are the, the building blocks, so to speak, of the universe. So that's kind of an amazing prediction. You start with a relatively simple principle, I say deceptively principle to be, deceptively simple to be fair, of a vibrating relativistic string. And from that, you conclude that the universe coming out of such a field, percolating these strings, looks like ours, or at least, at least roughly like ours. But it's a very different view of the universe. It's almost like this universal field, like a guitar string is a one-dimensional field. The surface of a pond is a two-dimensional field. This is a, a three or more dimensional field. But fields have their own vibrational states. We call them waves. And depending upon how the field is vibrating, depending upon the, the frequency of the wave, that wave will behave like a, a graviton, a particle, a so-called gravitino, a spin one force field, a spin one half fermion, or the newly discovered Higgs boson. 
There's an interesting relationship, which I can't begin to touch on today, that these five actually correlate in a very precise way to one of these ancient, you know, these quaint, ancient, prosaic theories of the universe as comprised fundamentally of five elements. And that's an interesting point, perhaps, for another day. Finally, I'm going to leave physics in a moment. I'm sure you'll be relieved. In addition to these superstrings that percolate from this time translationally environment, this, this sort of ocean of immortality, ocean of pure being, are not just these superstrings and not just particles, but entire universes. To the current ability of ours to calculate in the context of such theories, there is a finite probability that whole baby universes will emerge from this bubbling cauldron of what is called space-time foam, and most of those are duds. They disappear almost immediately in a burst of energy, but given the right initial conditions, they grow, some of them will grow exponentially, expand enormously, and that is called inflation, the inflationary universe, Big Bang Theory. And if you look at this picture carefully, you will see that there are several of these going on as we speak. And uh, some of those survive. And if you, you know, do the math even relatively simply, you would conclude that there is, um, depending upon a few, a few assumptions, probably an uncountable infinity of simultaneously coexisting universes continuously erupting from this enormous universal ocean of intelligence. And that is called today the multiverse, a scary concept. I'm not in love with it but is a concept that is sort of getting forced upon us as we look more deeply into the nature of this fundamental physical reality and start to fathom its intrinsic creativity and dynamism and incredible properties. End of physics, and I would like to shift gears, but this will be, I think, a useful background. Uh, any questions just on the physics, given the limited time we have, I'd be happy to take one or two. This will be part of the test at the end of the course. <laughs> in this context, in this physical framework, what is consciousness and what is meditation? Now here I'm going to draw upon two sources. And a lot of what I say is not familiar or that familiar or yet familiar to uh, Western psychological science. Familiar, certainly to some people within it, but it's not really common parlance in Western psychological science. Consciousness is structured, human consciousness, one we can talk most clearly about, is structured in layers in parallel to the structure of the physical body, in parallel to the structure of the physical universe. Wow, what does that mean? Well, just subjectively, it means we have surface thoughts, concrete thinking, got to do this, got to do that almost an audible level of course thinking, pre-verbal, in some cases even verbal. But quieter than that, in a more subtle, quiet, and expansive frame of mind, is the world of, of abstract concepts, the world, you could say, of the mathematician, the scholar. And this is a quiet and a literally more expansive style of thinking with a rather different character, and I'll talk about that and even deeper, more abstract, more refined, more silent levels of thought. And these different levels of thought have a correspondence that can be rigorously unfolded to different levels of physical nature. And here's a, a simplified, I've truncated this argument, but mathematics is probably the most, the most successful formalization of the structure of human mind, structure of human thought, structure of human logic. In mathematics, comes in, in different layers of concreteness versus layers of greater subtlety, greater power, greater comprehension, greater completeness. And if we just, to make this idea familiar, and it probably is to some of you, we can start with the natural numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three. These are the numbers we learn first. These are the numbers that have most concrete meaning and most concrete relevance in practical living. You go to the store, you buy three apples, not pie. Not the square root of negative one, but you know, one, two, three apples. And that's you know, its own numerical framework. Interestingly enough, if you add one more element to it called zero, you go from the natural numbers to the whole numbers. 
Not a big deal, you wouldn't think, but it's kind of a big deal because the whole numbers are more complete. It's a more powerful numerical system. There are things about the natural numbers that are true but unprovable. And once you add the so-called additive identity zero, you can prove things about the natural numbers that were always true but unprovable before because your numerical system didn't have sufficient power. All this power is at the expense of some concreteness. The number zero is just a bit more abstract than the number three. A bit more abstract. You don't go to the store to buy zero apples, and it's not a number people that use so much, unless you're an accountant or something, they use so much in day-to-day -day living. If you add the negative numbers, minus one, two, three, et cetera, you have what are called the integers. The integers are a more holistic, more powerful numerical framework. You now have a system of numbers that is closed under subtraction. And in that respect, it's more powerful. And you can prove a lot of things about the whole numbers that were true but unprovable. You now have a more powerful framework at the expense of being a bit more abstract. To these, you add the fractions, 0.732 or 2 thirds or 7 eighths. You have a more powerful system, a more comprehensive system, a system almost good enough to do physics. Not quite. For that, you actually have to add not just the reals, not just the rationals, but the irrationals in order to get the real numbers. And the irrationals fill in all the holes in between all the rationals. And they have the form of something like 0.732853, et cetera, without end. And they're difficult to even write down, obviously. And they're really, in a sense, somewhat difficult to even describe. But with this system of real numbers, you can at least do physics. You can do calculus. You can do Newtonian physics. But you're at a deeper conceptual level, less concrete, much more powerful at the expense of being more abstract. Next step, add numbers proportional to the square root of negative 1, so-called imaginary numbers. And it's a good word for them, because I'm not even going to try to explain to you what they mean. They're really a, a giant step removed from practical day-to-day -day reality but enormously more powerful. Without these numbers, the reals plus the imaginaries equaling, equaling the complex numbers, you cannot do quantum mechanics. You cannot understand the atom, let alone the atomic nucleus, let alone the unified field. So different levels of mind, different levels of conceptual wholeness relate to different, more holistic, but more abstract levels of nature. These levels of nature are more abstract, more powerful. Like that, we have levels of mind. From this perspective, meditation classically understood from the fundamental sort of historic yogic tradition, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, the Bhagavad Gita, and so on. And from there, Buddhism, at least early Buddhism, Meditation was understood as a technique to take our active thinking mind and our outwardly directed attention and turn the attention powerfully within to begin to experience and explore quieter levels of mind, deeper and deeper levels of the thinking process. And as the mind gets increasingly quiet and expansive and quiet and expansive very quickly or not so quickly, that's a question of technique, the awareness gets drawn completely beyond any localized concept or boundary of thought to experience a state of absolute abstraction, pure subjectivity, pure wakefulness, pure being, which is either a bunch of empty words or it has some meaning to you, depending on perhaps whether you may have glimpsed that experience at some time or other, in which case what I'm saying will make maybe a little more sense. This is the so-called meditative state. This is samadhi. It's not enlightenment. Uh, it's samadhi. In the Yoga Sutras, the first couple of verses read, yoga, experience of unity, inner union. Union with what? Union with universal intelligence. Union of individual mind with universal intelligence. Yoga is the complete settling of the activity of the mind. Then, and automatically then, if you don't fall asleep, automatically then, the seer, the experiencer, is established in the self. And the self, or Atman, in this tradition, 
is not our time-space-bound self. It's not our physical body. It's not our fluctuating thoughts. It's not our fluctuating moods. It's, our, it's the field of our own inner subjectivity, inner wakefulness, inner consciousness, which is at the basis of every experience, but which itself is rarely experienced. So that's the meditative state, samadhi. And it is called, it's been known historically at least, described throughout the ages as a fourth state of human consciousness, distinct from waking, dreaming, or deep sleep. Those are the three cycling relative states of consciousness. Samadhi has nothing to do with time. A timeless state, non-changing state. And from a modern scientific perspective, I think we can say, since about 1970 and increasingly all the time, this meditative state, and there are different states one can experience in meditation. I'm really talking more specifically about samadhi, classic meditation state, slipping beyond thought altogether to experience pure being. It is a fourth state of consciousness. It is metabolically distinct and neurophysiologically distinct and certainly subjectively, experientially distinct from waking, dreaming, or sleeping. When the mind becomes absolutely still, the body sim simultaneously gains a state of deep relaxation or deep rest, significantly different from what is normally called rest or relaxation or even sleep. Rest, I'm getting you know, kind of practical here, but trust me, I won't stay practical for very long. Uh, rest, of course, is a very powerful antidote to stress. Relaxation is you know, a powerful antidote to stress. And the different levels of rest you can achieve at night or through prayer or through some meditation practice, which can perhaps, at least in principle, really settle the individual, bring a sense of great comfort. To the degree that we're settling deeply, to that degree, stress is dissolved. And with it, stress-related diseases are relieved and or prevented. So for example, one very common technique to transcend, and that's really what the M technique is for. It's, it's really for transcending, among other techniques. But the transcending is the key uh, to much of my discussion, not the technique for how to get there. But um, the point is that state of transcending is a state of deep rest. And for example, high blood pressure, which is the most important risk factor for heart disease, is ameliorated um, more effectively than through hypertensive drugs, typically, uh, and more effectively than what is normally called relaxation, which is relaxing and generally good for you, but maybe not as deep a state of physiological rest. The American Heart Association did the largest study ever done. That was just this spring, excuse me, late last spring. It's already 2014. And they looked at all kinds of alternative approaches to reducing high blood pressure and heart disease. And they, it was the best. The early research was done at Stanford, a really excellent meta-analysis of um, many, many hundreds of published studies was, was done here. But the AHA just did another gigantic study, and they concluded, and have a formal policy statement, that doctors should prescribe transcending, it mentioned specifically TM, for patients with blood pressure over 120 millimeters of mercury, which I suspect is you know, a, great, a great many of you. Bottom line, when it comes to, to heart attack, I'm going to get off this subject of health soon, because it's kind of common sense. Most disease is caused by stress or complicated by stress. If there is a really effective way to get rest deeper than sleep, deep rest at will, it seems plausible that you can unwind stress more effectively than mere sleep, which helps enormously, but doesn't always completely do the trick. And so this is a very interesting study, nine-year longitudinal study, random control assignment study, funded by the NIH, which was just published in the last couple of years showing a two-thirds drop in heart attack, stroke, and death in two random assigned groups, both at risk of heart disease. Both groups took their medicines. Both groups supposedly stuck to their dietary and to their exercise regimens. 
the actual compliance with those was pretty poor. And one group, though, added transcending 20 minutes twice a day to their regimen. And that group, that was the only difference, experienced a marked drop in heart disease. That was big news. There's more to health than heart disease. And according to Blue Cross Blue Shield and their own statistics, transcending is a very effective antidote to every category of disease on which they keep statistics, which is every category of disease, the only disease that wasn't reduced was childbirth, which is arguably not a disease. <laughs> the meditators were having just as many babies. And you put that all together. This is my last health-related slide. Stress and fatigue cause wear and tear on the system over the course of a lifetime. And when you really stay up and cram for an exam, maybe several nights in a row, you'll start to feel the effects of aging. And most of that will go away when you finally get some rest. But it does leave a mark. Deeper rest of transcending starts to really diffuse deeply seated stress. And the result of that is people who do this regularly take, you know, say, 20 minutes twice a day, which is typically what an adult is recommended for an adult. And your biological age, your, your Cardiovascular age and other ways that doctors can tell you how old you are, even if you lose your birth certificate. Fine people are about 12 to 15 years younger than their chronological counterparts, just from meditating. A lot of other things you can do to improve health and longevity, but this is the easiest for sure. All right, I am an educator and more interested in the brain and brain development. And here I just have a couple of, just a couple of important things, I think, to say. Remember, from the perspective of today's talk on meditation, and there will be others, because there are different things you can do when you sit and close your eyes and practice a meditation program for different types of results and even for different reasons. And there are many ways to use the mind. There are many ways to develop the mind. Mathematics is one thing. Anything you study is going to develop your mind and your mental abilities, at least in specific respects, specific ways. So there are many things you can do to develop the mind. What I'm talking about today is in the classic sense of meditation, as defined, for example, in the Yoga Sutras, is taking the awareness as efficiently as you can beyond thought. And this is an automatic process. The idea, I mean, you think about it, well, how am I going to quiet the mind completely? Uh, you know, forget it. Um, it's just a matter of, of technique. If you've, nobody ever told you how to go to sleep, you may you know, never fall asleep if you're there watching television all night long. But if they say, look, you know, turn off the TV, you know, lie down like this, and do this and do that, and you'll probably fall asleep. It's like that with meditation. There's certain conditions you set up, certain simple techniques with the mind you can do, and find the mind being just lured being just kind of sweetly lured to these deeper and deeper levels of mind, which are so fulfilling, they're so intrinsically charming, so kind of fascinating that your mind just goes there. You just give a taste of the direction. You know, when you smell, the, you walk through an airport and there's a Cinnabon somewhere, and you kind of smell this thing and you just go for it. It's like that with the mind. Give it a taste of what it's like going to deeper levels of mind, and that's all the mind wants to do. So this is easy. It's just a question of like a diver. It's a question of how you leave the board, and kind of the rest is automatic. Different levels of mind, surface, active, concentrating mind, quiet states of self-reflection, and beyond thought, state of being. Each of these has a completely different style of brain functioning. The electrical activity of the brain, the activity brain can be studied in many ways. EEG is a good approach to meditation because things change by the moment. If you use something like PET or SPECT or you know, MRI, fMRI, things, you know, you can capture things that are happening slowly, but the EEG provides a window of things that are changing very fast. The whole signature of active thinking mind and concentration focus is a lot of cognitive processing, a lot of high frequency, <coughs> high amplitude gamma. In a meditation technique that focuses more on a state of, of quiet self, sort of reflection, self-observation, so called in the scientific literature, typically open monitoring, uh, mindfulness is a very common, popular form of this type of quiet self-reflection, and there are versions of that too. But it's a completely different state of mind. 
then this active, concentrated, cognitive processing state. And then slipping beyond mental activity altogether, beyond mind, to experience consciousness has its own very interesting physiological state. So different levels of mind have their own levels of neurophysiological activity. And the signature for this meditative state, for transcending, for samadhi, is this a state of a very high amplitude alpha coherence. Here's a picture of the whole brain, front to back. And you see something that's quite unique to the meditative state or to samadhi. You see, the entire brain, during experiences of the transcendent, the whole brain is functioning in concert in a highly integrated, highly coherent, almost synchronous fashion. If you process this mathematically and you look at what's going on in terms of the coherent functioning of the brain during relaxation versus samadhi, they're quite different. This is somebody with an eyes closed relaxation and these different dots are where the electrodes are placed on the scalp to look at the electrical firing of the neurons within the brain. And occasionally you see a bar connecting neighboring points measured on the scalp. And that means those two points are talking to each other. Those two parts of the brain are functioning in a correlated fashion. There's some kind of coordination. Some, some, there's some coherence in there, but not a whole lot. And in the meditative state, this is the same person. Three months later, they've learned to meditate. This is during the meditation experience. The whole brain is basically functioning in a completely integrated way. And that's remarkable, remarkable for a brain guy because you don't see this in waking, dreaming, sleeping, hypnosis, or anesthesia, or any drug-induced state that I'm aware of. This um, orderly brain functioning is not only philosophically or, or interesting from the neuroscientist perspective, but it's actually very useful because orderly brain functioning, what's called global EEG coherence, and we all have some coherent. You would not be in this room today if there were not some orderly coherent activity taking place in your brain. But that orderly brain functioning and the extent of orderly brain functioning translates to orderly thinking. Orderly thinking translates to orderly speech, coherent speech, and translates to coherent, purposeful, effective action. Typically, that means fulfilling action. But this orderly brain functioning, according to research, correlates with increasing IQ. Really? Increasing intelligence. Wait a minute. Or increasing academic performance. Learning ability, short-term and long-term memory. Creativity, according to test. Alertness, moral reasoning. Psychological stability, emotional maturity. Everything good about the brain, it turns out, depends on its orderly functioning. And as an educator, taught in many places, um, the idea, the reality of having something you can do, any student can do, any adult in a nursing home can do. That was a very interesting Harvard study on the institutionalized elderly with TM and what happened to their memory, longevity, health. But the fact that you know, there is something you can do that increases intelligence and creativity. And all measures of intelligence that are used within the field of education today are highly statistically significantly improved by transcending. That's fairly remarkable. It would have maybe been considered impractical because everybody knows the brain you know, forges new connections and learn things very quickly, but sometime in the 30s, certainly by my age, you have this precipitous and disastrous loss of raw intelligence, the pruning of the brain. <laughs> but now we know, and we've known now for probably 15 years, that the brain is so plastic and so malleable, so capable of forging new connections and learning fundamentally new things really throughout life. But the problem with the brain, they also say, is it's use it or lose it. And it's the use of the brain in a very creative educational environment that will develop certain competencies that you did not have before. And it's this, specifically, it's the utilization of the entire brain in a highly integrated way 
that correlates with intelligence, creativity, more than anything else. So that makes this idea of experiencing samadhi and then increasing the orderliness of brain function, not just during, because who cares, but after meditation is a very, very significant finding. This is a stressed brain. If you walking around campus, everywhere for that matter. And what stress does is really the opposite of what we really want in terms of brain functioning. Challenge is a good thing. Overwhelming challenge that causes stress and induces a fight or flight response is not a good thing. That kind of stress shuts down the prefrontal cortex, the higher brain, which is responsible for our higher human functions, judgment, planning, moral reasoning. And under chronic stress, unfortunately, and certainly parts of the world are under chronic stress. I think in general life can be under chronic stress. Chronic stress shuts down the higher brain chronically. And to the extent the higher brain is shut down chronically, it's not developing, fails to develop properly. And if it doesn't be developed by the age of 25, it's not going to develop at all. And because of this pervasiveness of stress, this is something the Surgeon General has also been, been, been promoting recently, the, we're using, we have an underutilization of the full resource of the human brain. The, he was said, actually, we seem to be living in a society of arrested development, meaning that you know, we're stuck in various stages of adolescence. It's really at the age of 12 to the age of 25 that we really gain the full utilization, really any utilization, of the prefrontal cortex, the executive center of the brain, the CEO of the brain. And uh, unfortunately, you know, stress impedes the development of that. A few comments about acute stress, and we get back to higher states of consciousness and hopefully to some questions. Acute stress and its manifestation as PTSD is the result of overwhelming trauma, chronic or more typically overwhelming trauma. And what happens in that state is something called the amygdala or fear center of the brain gets overloaded and sometimes stuck on hyperdrive. It's like jamming the foot down on the accelerator of your car so hard that you break the linkage and you take your foot off the accelerator and it lies flat down. And your car is revving. It's not an ideal situation to find yourself in. Now normally rest, relaxation, allows these sorts of things to normalize. But unfortunately for somebody often who's had that kind of trauma, the normal rest of sleep does not get rid of that constant hypervigilance and insomnia. And the tendency, because the fear center, if there's interest, we'll talk about it more. Fear center is on constant state of vigilance so that everybody, everything, every circumstance is perceived instinctively as a threat. And you're constantly, because of that, in a state of fight or flight. What's really exciting uh, is some of the re recent research that's been done shows that the deeper rest of samadhi, this meditative state, calms. It effectively deactivates the amygdala. And in a bit, about 40% of the subjects in these studies that are funded by the, N by the um, DOD and by the Veterans Administration are relieved of most of their symptoms after one meditation. It's like you have a computer that's gathered all kinds of crud, and you've, somebody finally told how somebody says, when's the last time you rebooted your computer? So I haven't rebooted it for months. I just put it to sleep at night. So that person will unplug your computer for you, whatever, and reboot it. And what happens is you get a complete you know, reboot. You're resyncing the whole system, refreshing the whole system. That's what samadhi, it's like that's what it does. It resets, resyncs, almost reboots. It's like you come out of this completely new. It's like everything, like a good night's sleep, but more so, so incredibly fresh. You know, you still owe $3,000 to the bank, but you know, you've, you're completely fresh. You have a whole new perspective <laughs> and a whole new capability of dealing with it. So that's amazing. Because of that, I find this amazing. I didn't know whether I've lived long enough to see this, but the militaries of the world, Lots of them, and our own, 
uh, Department of Defense and Veterans Administration and military academies like Norwich University are incorporating TM into military training as a, an antidote, a vaccine against the ravages of war stress. Um, many educators are very familiar with a phenomenon called ADHD. It's also a stress-related learning disorder. And the research calming or restoring balanced brain functioning and integrated brain functioning, the research is really impressive. That the, the very, very deep rest, it's probably more than just the deep rest. That helps dissolve the angst and the stress that tends to fuel this condition. But it's the resynchronization of the brain and the reintegration. It's the higher brain, the prefrontal cortex, that controls our attention. It's the controller of the attention. It's the executive of the brain. And if that part of the brain has been shut down, a person has very little control over their attention, these kids are bouncing off the wall. The first question you might ask is, are they going to be able to meditate, even close their eyes? Instinctively, the teachers would say, no. But you know, a, a, an efficient technique for transcending, which starts the mind just traversing in the direction of more expansion, more happiness, more satisfaction, these kids are just gone. You know, after like a minute, you know, they're just in there. And after 10 minutes, you know, somebody has to say, 10 minutes is up. For somebody who's that age, 10 minutes of meditation is enough. They don't have the crust of stress that the rest of us do. So those results are amazing. And as a result of the research on that, schools around here and all over the country and all over the world are incorporating transcending, a simple technique for transcending called TM into the curriculum. And we're talking about a million students now at 350 schools. I did not think this would happen. Three years ago, I would have said, you know, no way. I'm kind of an optimist, but when it comes to schools and parents and religion, you have to really make a solid case for this, that it's not a religious practice. It may have religious or spiritual implications, but that's not what the kids are taught. They're taught a technique, pure and simple, to take the mind effortlessly to a place where they're going to be really able to relieve stress and come back into class alert, focused, and revitalized. That's an amazing thing. It started really, not surprisingly, as a Midwesterner, I will say not surprisingly, in San Francisco, and, but it has now swept the world. In a different talk, this is our friend Jack Welsh. We could talk about uh, strengthening the executive functioning of the brain. I'll skip by that. I do want to uh, end before we take discussion. Back where I started, and that is samadhi and higher states of consciousness. We talked about this meditative state, state of absolute silence. You could say almost absolute abstraction, absolute expansion, nothing of a specific content to color or delimit the awareness. It is almost, it is, it's a tribute less in being so completely non-specific. There's nothing to give it any sense of time or change or relativity. The structure of this fourth state of consciousness, which I should say maybe has been considered in recent history, not in early history, but in recent history, difficult to achieve, is absolutely not Patanjali's point of view in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It's a four, four, basically four chapters. They're all dedicated to transcending. And the third and fourth chapters are dedicated exclusively to samadhi. It's not difficult, but I suppose you can always get in the way of doing so, like you could get away in the way of going to sleep. If you really you know, squirm and struggle enough, you won't fall asleep. And it's really like that, in a sense, with transcending. The structure of samadhi is very simple. In the process of taking the awareness within, which means taking the outwardly directed attention systematically within to experience and explore different levels of mind. In the deeper levels of mind, actually, the awareness is more expanded. It's like when we focus on something which is really the opposite of meditation, the way I'm defining it. Focusing on something like this is a sort of a localization of the awareness onto something very relative and very concrete. With the, in meditation, the awareness is basically retiring from that sharp focus. In the process of retiring from that sharp focus, there's nothing so concretely stark to localize the attention. 
So the attention, there's less to localize, becoming more diffuse, more unlocalized, more unbounded. And then when the object of thought, a mantra is typically used for this purpose, specific type of mantra called a transcending mantra is used for this purpose, then the awareness is completely not bound by anything. So in that state, you have experience, you are in, immersed in the experience of our purely abstract, maximally expanded, silent self. At the expense of everything else, everything else for that moment. And this is usually experienced as a relatively fleeting few seconds. And it does become more stable, more accessible with a little bit of culturing and practice. But for that moment, you've given up everything. So don't tell your mother, write your mother, say, I'm really getting interested in, in, this, in, in really just you know, experiencing samadhi, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to meditate all day long. And they will say, well, you know, who's going to support you? Who's going to support me? Um, this is a non-functional state. It is intrinsically satisfying. It's extrinsically blissful in the most sort of sublime and subtle and expansive way. But it's a non-functional state. It's called, considered to be a stepping stone to something more significant. Before I leave it, though, let me just take a few quotes, in this case from the Upanishads, about this fourth state of consciousness. The fourth condition, fourth state of consciousness, is Atman, the self, in his own pure state, the awakened life of supreme consciousness. Also from the Upanishads, it is neither this nor that, neither inner nor outer, nor semi-consciousness, nor sleeping consciousness. It cannot be seen or touched. It is above all distinction, beyond thought, and ineffable. In the union with that is the supreme proof of his reality. Very important point for philosophers of science and philosophers of consciousness. It is peace and love. So there has been debate, and probably is debate across this campus and across the centuries, as to whether consciousness even exists. You never see it. Indirectly, you do, because it's the light of consciousness within that allows us to see everything else. But the consciousness itself is hidden, completely overshadowed by the content of experience. And because of the fact that you can't smell it, can't taste it, can't see it, and typically don't even experience it, unless you happen to kind of, by accident or by practice, escape the confines of our constantly changing experience to instead, for a moment, be left free for consciousness to experience itself. That's samadhi. Then you can say, oh, oh, I was not experiencing anything, not absorbed in any thought, any feeling, any idea, and yet I was beyond time. I go on forever. That's the real proof of it. Otherwise, you can argue it. But honestly, the experience of it is it's not really, it's beyond intellect. The very nature of intellect, we can talk around it. We can point to it. But the nature of intellect is to discriminate, to distinguish this from this. It is, it is dual by its nature, by drawing distinctions. Whereas consciousness is just pure unity. Now, moving on to the last but important point, and that is, you know, why meditate? Well, today, you know, medical science will give us many reasons why we should meditate. Educators who have done research will give you many reasons why it's good for your academic achievement, good for your executive functioning. But traditionally, that was not how meditation was sold. Meditation was for the experience of samadhi, know thyself, by direct experience of the self, and more important than just glimpsing it, live it. And living it is called, a classically, traditionally called, enlightenment. So how do we define enlightenment, at least in this lesson today? Well, in the one sense, it's this maximum orderliness and expansive state of brain functioning, maximum EEG coherence, stabilized. 
which means not just during the meditative state, but when you're out in activity, dynamically engaged in activity, whether it's a sports competition or a computer game or an exam, that orderliness of brain functioning, the inner calm, inner silence, inner stability is stabilized. I'll come back to that. It's kind of important. Here's a quote. This is about enlightenment. It's sometimes called nirvikalpa samadhi, which means unbroken samadhi, continuous samadhi, or nitya samadhi, which means eternal samadhi. The state of yoga, samadhi, experience of unity, becomes a well-founded state, an established state, when it has been respectfully and uninterruptedly cultured for a long time. Well, is that true? Yes, scientifically, it appears to be true. I'm going to give you a quick, very quickly, a look at the brain during meditation of a relatively new meditator and somebody who's been doing it twice a day for a number of years, eight years in the case of this particular subject, one of hundreds of subjects in this study. And if you go to the brain, you try to compare what's going on in this relatively new meditator and somebody who's been experiencing samadhi regularly for some time, you'd be hard pressed to find a difference. Really mathematically, if you crunch the numbers, there's not a whole lot of difference. It seems like transcending is transcending. Samadhi is samadhi, whether you're experiencing for the first time or the fifth time or the 500th time. The difference is outside of meditation, after meditation. And then what you find is that this orderliness of brain function, the state of absolute clarity and coherence, inner silence, it dissipates very quickly when your eyes open up and you, you know, realize you're late for class and all that. But in the longer term meditator, this uh, alpha coherence in, across the entire brain remains with you in activity. So now the whole brain is functioning coherently, but instead of doing nothing, it's engaged in a task. But the brain resources are all utilized in virtually everything you do. Not just, it turns out, during dynamic activity, but even during sleep. It's just interesting enough to point out. First, some quotes from the Yoga Vasishta about enlightenment. He is awake, but enjoys the calmness of deep sleep. Or he is awake in deep sleep. So when this inner light, you could say, samadhi, turns on, at that point, at some point, it's inextinguishable. And you could be in the midst of a dynamic dream, but now witnessing and enjoying that dream from kind of a cosmic vantage point of unbounded inner immovability. Or under the knife during surgery, under anesthesia, absolutely out cold, like a rock. But that inner awareness, inner light of consciousness is not extinguished by that. Time passes instantly because there's no gears turning, no cognitive processing in the brain that are ticking off time. So that's a very quick process of going in and going out. But during that whole time, the continuum of the unboundedness or universality of the self persists. And that's, that's what the research shows in longer term meditators, that during the high amplitude delta waves of deep sleep, superimposed is the high amplitude alpha coherence of samadhi in one state that you could call enlightened sleep or witnessing sleep. A couple more points about enlightenment because it's a very important subject. I may not get to see you again during this short course. Why is it called liberation? Self-realization. Self-realization because by direct experience, you realize the core nature of the self as basically beyond time. If that's the nature of the self, huge, expanded, universal, cosmic, to really know that with any confidence, experience, experience, experiencing it until you get it. But liberation means something a little bit more. It's a Buddhist kind of a Buddhist term, but I think it's a very accurate term to be used in this type of description. Let's look at the structure of enlightenment. In the state of enlightenment, you have the inner experience of absolute silence. The self is established within itself. 
as a silent witness to the dynamic change blowing on the surface of life. But in this case, you haven't sacrificed everything. You're back in your waking life. Whether you've got an exam to take, whether you have a race to run, whether you have a book to read, all of that surface activity of thought, speech, action is taking place not at the expense anymore of the self. Established in the self, you were engaged in action. And the reason this is called liberation is because if you erase this, you turn out the light, which means you somehow forget the nature of the inner self, then all you're left with is pretty much life as we know it, the changing relative. And the changing relative is filled with change. It's filled with ups and downs, successes and failures. And the Buddhists take a rather extreme point of view on this sometimes. They call that wor world the world of suffering. Certainly because it includes suffering, no doubt about it. That is the experience of many locked in circumstances in which they are locked. But the Buddhists would go so far as to say even getting that, you know, even you know, spending, buying some wonderful thing is ultimately sorrow because even as you're spending it, you realize, oh, only, only $100 remains. Or that wonderful thing is starting to rust already and so forth. So the Buddhists would go so far as to say the whole world of activity is ultimately a world of, of suffering. I don't think most of us experience it that way, except from time to time. But the principle is at least true. As long as we are completely absorbed in our relative changing world, we are a bit like a football of circumstances that our emotions tend to be buffeted up and down by a good hair day or a very bad hair day. Liberation means you can be in the midst of a bad hair day, or good for that matter, and it is really such a surface phenomenon. Even some things we consider to be pretty important. In comparison to that, the origin of universes, if you want to think of it from a physics perspective, an intelligence that is so expansive, in which individual awareness unites with that same fundamental intelligence that percolates strings and universes, <laughs> that honestly, from that natural perspective, it's not an intellectual mood we're making, just from the experience of the continuum of silent contentment within, nothing, frankly, is so important that it overshadows, overthrows your equanimity, leaving you free, basically, to engage fully the house is on fire, you get in there and you do it. But at the same time, you are completely, you're completely stable and silent and collected within. So here's a quote about that. In the state of permanent samadhi, he is in his own being, pure, never changing, never, move, never moving, unpollutable, and in peace beyond desires, he watches the drama of the universe. Even though fully engaged in action, not a sense of like reclusiveness, that's a misunderstanding of the nature of enlightenment. Fully engaged in action, he does not act at all. Is, and this is a Buddhist quote, quite recognizably so. Established in the self, one overcomes sorrows and suffering. There's one last point I want to make. Do I have time for one last point? This idea of thought or intention having power. It's this idea we can't seem to get rid of. Does thought have power? When I was growing up, it was a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. Anybody old enough to remember that book? Uh, more recently, it was The Secret. But if you look back throughout even scriptural history, this idea that intention has some kind of manifesting power has been with us for a long time. Well, of course, we know to some degree intention has manifesting power. It's our intention and our motivation that gets us out of bed to go and achieve what we have to achieve. So of course, mind you know, has power. But this means something different. This, the idea is just holding the intention has some strength of its own, some manifesting or precipitating strength of its own. I was uh, the token scientist chosen to go on, 
on an Oprah show, which is about this very popular book. And I said, yes, I would come, but there's something about the book I don't fully agree with, and I feel obligated to explain it. Otherwise, you're gonna have a lot of frustrated guests, a lot of frustrated viewers. And I said that, you know, the secret, there in the book you'll see testimonials which I believe are valid. These are sincere testimonials of miraculous results. You put the sticker on your refrigerator that says pearl necklace, and then 12 months later, it came, the very same one I wanted. Um, there are a lot of stories like that, and there have been, frankly, throughout time. But you probably find there are more people that put the sticker on the refrigerator and dutifully remind themselves of that desire that they're supposed to keep nourishing. In a month, you know, a year later, they're very frustrated because they're no closer to the pearl necklace than they were before. And just lo and behold, three days before the show, Oprah canceled the show, saying they had too many guests who were disappointed by the book. And I said, well, that's too bad because I, I could have explained why it works and why it doesn't and perhaps how to make it work. Now, we've already talked about it. I don't have to explain anything more about it. There are different levels of mind. Different levels of mind have greater and greater conceptual power and even greater physical power, physical energy, because each of these levels of mind corresponds to deeper and deeper levels of physical reality. Now the correspondence between these two can be very sharp. We've talked in this course briefly, classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, unified field theory. And these terms aren't as familiar from Western psycho psychological science, but in the literature of yoga and the Vedic literature and Buddhist literature and so forth, there are these four levels of mind. Vaikari, which is almost articulated thought, surface thought, abstract conceptual thought, fine feeling level, that level of finest refined feeling, which is very deep within, but very important to the quality of our life. This is where an artist, fine artists, might spend most of their time, and then there's samadhi. This correspondence between levels of mind and levels of physical reality is very deep, and I gave a little bit of a hint at it earlier today. But again, you know, this meditative process is the process of getting more and more intimately familiar with deeper and deeper levels of thought, where thoughts are more powerful. So somebody might ask me, I've certainly been asked many times, does prayer have power? And I have to say, I'll, I'll answer this as a physicist and as a meditator. In my experience, it depends. I went to a church service in South Central LA. It was a very dramatic service of worship. And people were actually leaping around and shouting out the name of God. And it was kind of exciting, you know, on a surface level, it was really kind of an exciting experience. But there are deeper, I think, more profound traditions of worship where you might go and experience you know, uh, God's presence at a fine level of feeling, and perhaps you have a more pervasive effect on the physiology, maybe the environment. And then there's the idea, I won't call it prayer, but you know, from a religious perspective, you might think of it as prayer, taking the mind beyond thought to identify with universal intelligence on the level of pure being. That's the level from where thoughts emerge, first as a fine impulse, and then take up more concrete shape as they work their way through the machinery of thought. But it's at that level where a mustard seed, this is a tiny impulse of thought, could, I suppose, in principle, move mountains. So the secret behind the secret, I'd have to say, is <laughs> transcend. I'm going to stop there. A provocative statement was made by one very impressive person, uh, is that life begins not at 40, thank goodness, or I've already missed it, 50, not even 60, but life really begins at enlightenment. And what that means is that enlightenment is when we are permanently aware of the field of pure life, pure awareness, pure vitality, and until that experience, we're living, in a sense, indirectly only. The experience of consciousness, the experience of life, as, as it is reflected in our experience. But the field itself, which is absolute contentment, absolute expansion, is missed. So in one literal sense, at least, the field of life becomes accessible momentarily during meditation, during samadhi 
becomes accessible permanently, even during sleep, even during anesthesia, God forbid, forbid that becomes necessary. Permanently established in the self comes from regular immersion, alternated with activity. Regular submersion in the self, alternated with, and that's all it takes. And it takes a little time, but it's not a thing to be impatient about because the very process of meditation and tasting it brings benefits really from day one. So that's what I want to convey today. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.